This is Politics NY, not with Sky. I am Alex Mitchell, joined with Editor-in-Chief of Politics NY, Stephen Witt. Welcome to the Schneps Media Rapid Fire Debates for City Council District 10. We're talking about the neighborhoods of Washington Heights, Inwood, and Marble Hill. We are joined with candidates James Baer, Angela Fernandez, Carmen De La, De La Rose, and Joanna Garcia. Everybody, thank you so much for, for joining us. It is Cinco de Mayo, and it is happy hour right now, so you guys are making tough decision being here. We appreciate it. Let's go around and get to know everybody in what Steve and I call an elevator pitch, is where we'd like to hear you talk about why you're running for office in about 45 seconds. So let's start with Joanna. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm Joanna Garcia and I'm running for District 10. I am a daughter of immigrants and a single mother of three children. You can count on me to fight for youth, our families, our seniors, and a city that works for all of us because that is what I've done all my life. I know what it's like to be evicted. I know what it is to fight um, discrimination and racism. I've worked as a family literacy coordinator, built up my own not-for-profit, and I've been on the right side of the issues um, that have resonated in this community. I also have government experience. I was chief of staff to city council member Jackson, as well as right, chief of staff to right, right, the Senate. <laughs> Carmen. Hi, I am Carmen De La Rosa. Um, I am a candidate for city council district 10. Um, and I'm running because Washington Heights, Inwood and Marble Hill are the communities that I know and love. I grew up here, I immigrated here from the Dominican Republic as a baby, and then uh, grew up here and raising my children, my, my, my daughter here, my family here. Um, this is the community that uh, has seen me grow up and it's a community that has historically been left behind by government. In the last four years, I've served this community as the New York State Assembly member, uh, delivering for our community, everything from rent, historic rent laws that protect tenants to moving forward an agenda that protects immigrants, protects workers. I'm looking forward to bringing that same fight, that same spirit to the city council in 2022 to make sure that the voices of the most vulnerable in our community are always prioritized. Thank you, Angela. Thank you so much for, um, for having me. My name is Angela Fernandez. I'm running for uh, District 10. Um, my mother worked in uh, factories. Um, she's from the Dominican Republic and she worked in factories to produce the only lawyer in the family. Um, I myself worked as a super while I was at Columbia Law School. Uh, the value she taught me when I graduated was um, when you have a powerful tool like that law degree, you have to use it to uplift your community, which is what I have been doing for the last three decades. Um, I ran an immigrants' rights organization for 10 years, preventing the deportation of thousands of our neighbors, helping tens of thousands of our neighbors become U.S. citizens, and hand in hand with the most marginalized in our community, immigrants with criminal convictions. We fought and created the sanctuary laws that exist in the city today that became a model across the country. I was the New York State Commissioner for the Division of Human Rights, leading a 200 person agency made up of investigators, lawyers, and administrative law judges. And in less than a year was able to turn that agency around, leading to a 25% increase in monetary damages for people who had been discriminated against. We need a city council member that understands the interplay between social justice movements and government law and implementation of these laws so that we can have a much stronger district moving forward. Thank you, Angela. James. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm James Baer, and uh, I probably have the most unusual background. Uh, I am the child of refugee family from Nazi Germany, Jewish family. I'm very proud of what we've accomplished coming here penniless escaping, no one feels more strongly about protecting everyone's human rights than I do. Uh, I am a professor, I'm an attorney, I am a journalist, I am an author of America on the Verge, which years ago started talking about many of these progressive ideas before anyone else did. Um, we have a disaster in the city. We need a change of the guard. We don't need incumbents and we don't need establishment. The situation has collapsed. Close to a million out, out of work, uh, terrible deficits, a uh, city that's going to take years to recover from COVID. We need some really innovative ideas. I am a f history a fan. Franklin Roosevelt, the New Deal, we're going to have to start talking about some very, very 
sophisticated new ideas to recover. We can't go with the same old playbook as we have for the last few years. The education system has collapsed. We need major change, and I'm the guy who's going to do it if I get elected. Thank you, James. And now let's jump right into some of the issues. Steve, do you have a question that you want to kick us off with? I'd like to know from, from each of you, when you get to the city council, what is the one issue that, that the number one issue that you want to confront for the district that, that you feel needs to be confronted? Okay, and we're going to send it right back in the order, um, the reverse order, which we started. So James, we'll start with you. And again, just so we could cover as much ground as possible in this hour, we'd, we ask you to keep your responses between one and two minutes. Thank you. Where do we start? We have such a mess. The economy is in shambles. We're going to have to recover. We're going to have to rebuild the image of the city. We have to make sure people are healthy. The school system is in terrible shape. Um, first thing is about the economy. Okay. It's going to take longer to get the quarter million, jo quarter million jobs that have been lost because the tourism system is, situation is shut down. Now, that's one of the things we have to do, bring the tourists back, starting with creating a whole citywide system of cleaning everything up, ultraviolet uh, air filters everywhere in the city, from subway to school rooms. We should have been doing this a year ago. We should proudly have plaques and, and all kinds of stores saying, proudly saying, New York City, we are the safest city in the country. Bring back the tourists, bring back the jobs. Uh, we, we need to have help out the home, the, the, the mom and pop stores. Uh, the schools are in bad shape. I, I'm a professor, and one of the things I want to do is to completely restructure the school system. One of the biggest disgraces and racist forms that we deal with the city is graduating people from high school who don't even know how to read and write or barely struggle, okay? Providing jobs, giving people a fair chance in life, not having them start out with two strikes already. So there's too many things we have to do. I have an, a huge amount of environmental plans, including uh, making sure I have a 10 year plan where I wanna get solar panels and batteries on every rooftop in the city and I want them built in the city. We're talking about restructuring our cities that we're not so dependent on tourism and, and recessions. So there's many things I wanna do and I welcome everyone looking at my website, bearforcitycouncil.org, that's B-E-H-R. And uh, you're gonna see the deepest candidate who has the most diverse ideas and the deepest ideas, no 10 second sound bites, no uh, cliches. I have plans and I'm going to do everything I can to change things. And one more thing, if I get elected, you, everyone's going to be able to walk in my office and talk. Okay. I'm not going to be hiding like politicians tend to do. I want to hear from the community. We need to change the whole way things are done. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. There, there are many issues, um, uh, but I think the number one, especially within the first uh, quarter, is really a concerted effort focused on businesses. Small businesses, as many of us know, employ over half of our city. Our district has empty corridors, and my concern, the concern of my neighbors, is that they, we will have even more empty corridors. So there are a set of laws and, act, and also many things in place um, that we need to support to make sure that our small businesses can actually thrive. Number one, um, uh, pass a commercial rent stabilization law so that small businesses that have storefronts can actually continue um, to do their work there. Um, secondly, um, we need to um, ensure that we are not sending agencies in to fine our small businesses to death. We need to be able to actually restructure our agencies to provide support for our small businesses. And um, thirdly, we need to also provide funding to our small businesses. We have a very large budget. It's a $90 billion budget. And I actually propose that we actually provide grants to key small businesses so that they can actually get make this transition from the pandemic right now to our post-pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you so much. COVID recovery is in the forefront of all of our minds. I firmly believe that the road to recovery has already started, um, both on the state and on the city level. We've already begun programs uh, to deal with recovery post COVID. It's going to take creative, innovative ideas to make sure that our communities address issues that have been historically happening in Upper Manhattan. And one of those issues, the one that I hope to tackle in the first quarter and, and, and throughout the term really is displacement. 
Um, our community, in our community displacement, both of small businesses and residential displacement is rampant. We see predatory um, landlords, predatory speculation happening. We know that um, there was a rezoning that was recently passed in the district. And we know that we continue to see the symptoms of displacement taking over our community. So I look forward to sitting uh, on the housing committee, on the finance committee, and making sure that we are taking a good look at the Inwood NYC plan to make sure that we can undo some of the harms that are included there. Joanna. Thank you. Um, so first, I want to challenge James on having saying both that he has the most diverse um, and um, in-depth uh, platform. Um, I encourage um, voters to go look at my platform. But also, you know, small business um, is important, um, and I definitely support uh, the Small Business Survival Act as well as making sure that our businesses have every opportunity of surviving. Uh, but in this pandemic, what I really heard loud and clear is what's been true for everyone, food insecurity, yes, housing insecurity, and skyrocketing unemployment. Um, so we need to make sure we have a plan in COVID recovery um, that does create more jobs. We need to make sure that we address uh, food insecurity, and we need to make sure that people don't feel that they're insecure or about to lose their homes. But also, as an as a Afro-Latina, as a single working mom, I know deeply, and as someone who worked in the field of child care, there can be no conversation about recovery or really looking at our infrastructure without talking about childcare. We must provide childcare options, affordable quality childcare options for our parents so they can go back to work, so they can feel safe. It is something that has been ignored and it's something that we have to address. Well, thank you all. Steve, I believe you have a, another question that's very relevant to, to recent news as far as education goes. Uh, I have a couple questions to education, but the one question I would like to know and uh, Alex had piggy piggybacked is, uh, there's been a question regarding the specialized high school entrance exam and the gifted and talented program. And the, the schools are underrepresented with Latino, Latino in the black uh, communities. Do you believe in the gifted and talented program? Do you think it should be expanded or gotten rid of in the district? And what do you think of the SHSAT? <laughs> as to get into specialized high schools. And I'm also going to tack on one more. Oh. What do you think of uh, snow days um, no longer being a, a part of the DOE? Uh, Carmen, let's start with you and then go to Angela. As a mother of a six-year-old, absolutely we need snow days. Okay, so let me answer that one first. I wholeheartedly endorse snow days. We all need them, teachers need them. We need the moment to relax and play in the snow. Um, as far as gifted and talented, um, in our district, we actually haven't had a lot of access to gifted and talented programs um, in the district. I, I personally don't support the gifted and talented programs. I think they're a way of continuing to uh, segregate our school system. Um, we should be working to have a school system that lifts all boats together that allows, for example, special attention to our uh, special education students um, who need that one-on-one -on -one, uh, attention, as well as our English language learners who are often left behind. And this is the district where a lot of this is still happening. Um, so I would prefer that we invest um, in, in, in providing extra help and extra resources to lift all boats together. As far as the uh, specialized high school entrance exam, um, I, I would be in favor of actually doing away with it. I believe that uh, it cannot be the only criteria for us to admit students into, into our specialized schools. We've seen this criteria fail time and time again. I think I read a week ago uh, that only eight black students um, got into the specialized high school um, in, this, in this last round. We know that a test cannot tell you when a child is actually prepared to, um, to thrive in a school, does not tell you the personality of that child, does not tell you the grit that that child has to continue to learn. Um, and so that should not be the criteria in order to, uh, to admit a child. And I think that it continues to create segre uh, segregation in our school systems as well. 
as a, a disadvantage to communities that are often marginalized communities where you have immigrant parents, uh, working class parents that do not, that cannot afford some of the prep programs that exist for these tests. So we have to have a more holistic approach in order to see a more diverse uh, school system in the specialized high schools and, and in general. Thank you, Angela. Um, so I agree uh, with Carmen, uh, snow days are absolutely necessary um, uh, when there is a blizzard outside, um, uh, you know, the motivation to get in front of a Zoom is, you know, not going to be high for a lot of people. So I think just automatically, it's, it's presenting something that's not going to be very enforceable. Um, uh, I am someone who has always struggled with test taking. And I am also someone who um, entered the public school system not knowing English and with no ESL support at all. And I also remember the first time that the gifted and talented program was introduced into the school system. And um, uh, I remember distinctly what it felt like to have just a handful of kids chosen in a classroom because they were deemed smarter. And so I just think that all of that is actually quite damaging. So I, and there are many different ways that all people are intelligent. And so to quote um, another a mayoral candidate, Diane Morales, all New York City children are gifted and talented. And we need to orient our entire um, education system with, um, uh, with that understanding. And so I would do away with gifted and talented and I would do away with the specialized tests and um, uh, ensure that we are restructuring our schools so that all learning capabilities, all learning styles, are actually honored um, as we graduate our students into, into the world. Thank you, Joanna. Hi, um, this question is um, an interesting and question for me because I am an education activist. I've actually worked a great deal uh, around public education policy. And I, I got my, my activism chops um, working in the school system as a volunteer and also fighting against high stakes testing. And the reality is that our school system is the most segregated in the nation. And that is solely based because when you have admissions that are predicated on test scores, then we end up with classrooms that teach to test. We end up with classrooms where the test is actually a proxy for wealth and access. And the majority of the students in our public education system are, are students of color, they're immigrants. Um, they're recently arrived students from other countries. And so we are doing a huge disservice. And so definitely, I don't think uh, that you can actually say a four-year-old is gifted compared to another uh, four-year-old. I was happy to see the Department of Education recently uh, to do away with uh, gifted and talented programs. I think definitely that our school system needs to be revamped. We are ignoring, we are ignoring the tenements of an actual quality education. For years, we have ignored the evidence uh, that says that small class sizes actually contributes uh, to quality education. We have ignored that the arts contributes to quality education, critical thinking, field trips, we can do this. So I support, and in my work as chief of staff to Senator Jackson, I have supported the repeal of the Heck Calandra, uh, which puts in place and keeps in place uh, the testing for the Shasat. There is no way that a student can be summed up by a number. And I say this personally knowing I am a product of public education in New York City. I actually went to a gifted and talented school. Um, and so I, I've seen the whole 360 of this industry. It is a billion dollar industry and our KISS test scores are not for sale and it's really damaging their futures. Thank you. Thank you, James. Well, first of all, I'd like to make a reference to a comment by Ms. Garcia. Uh, I have nothing but respect for the accomplishments of, of everyone here in the intelligence and, and I'm proud to be um, together with everyone. Now, what, when it comes to schools, um, yeah, this specialized tests, uh, the whole thing is disturbing. Um, we all know that if you work harder than the SATs and the SHATs and all these things, you can do better. And, and then there are some very smart kids who, who have different levels of uh, accomplishments uh, who don't do as well as the test. I think the answer is we need to, like Ms. Uh, like, like was said, all boats rise. We need to double or triple the amount of schools. Anyone who's qualified to go to a school, no matter how they're doing the test, we need to create more of these things. I, I just don't understand why we're not thinking that way. Um, snow days, I missed them. I, I, I just don't think online education really does the job. 
Um, but what I really want to comment about is the whole education system. I have been teaching all my life. This is my passion. There has been so much discussion from people I talk to who teach about fudging grades, kids being put to the next level, even though they haven't passed. That is something that I think we really have to uh, deal with. If a kid gets an F, we have to give him an F. We have to be honest. We have to hire tutors, put them in the libraries. We need to completely restructure the system, mental health counseling, everything. I believe that we need to completely change the system. Uh, I think we need to decentralize the Board of Education, create smaller ones, let them move uh, at their own pace. The, the needs of Washington Heights are not the same as Soho or Queens. Uh, this just the, the education and, and reform moves like a glacier. There's too many things that have to be done. And I would start by making sure that kids get an honest education. Uh, I also want to say that I believe that the arts have been gutted for generations. I'm a Juilliard graduate. No one believes more about this than I do. Uh, I also think that we need to investigate vocational schools. Not every kid wants to go to college. They should have a whole system where they can train uh, for all kinds of professions, uh, starting in ninth, 10th, 11th grade. They can always go back to the college level. But your whole idea is we need to really reinvent the way we deal with education because what's been done for the last few generations we've got to change things. We can't keep going the way we are. And I will be one of the first people in the education committee, God willing, I get elected. This is what I'm going to push for. It was a tough job. We have to work with Albany, but it's time to really change the way things are done. We can't go another generation where kids aren't competent in reading and writing and basic skills after graduating high school. Unacceptable. And we should let them make sure they have a free college education if their income level is low. There's so much we need to do. So Steve, yeah, oh, um, Steve, I think uh, one of James comments actually spurs a question that I would like to ask, and that is, if elected, what are three committees you would want to join? And uh, Angela, let's start with you. You're muted. Uh, I forgot. I forgot about the, um, the mute. Um, uh, I would want to join uh, the finance committee, um, uh, the budget negotiation um, team. I know it's not a committee, but the budget negotiation team. And then um, the committee, the name has changed recently, but it would um, uh, oversee um, uh, the legal services uh, piece um, uh, around funding of legal services. Um, it's, uh, it's a critically important committee. I, uh, when I ran Northern Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights, um, uh, would add advocate in front of that committee to ensure that free legal services continue to be funded or and expanded for for low income people free attorneys is a life changer it is a game changer in people's lives and i think it's an underappreciated um uh, service thank you joanna I would uh, want to chair the Education Committee, uh, Housing, Land Use, Finance, and as one of the chairs for those committees, I'll automatically be on the budget negotiation team. <clears throat> James? Well, I, I think that the comments by my colleagues, they have expertise in many areas. Um, there's plenty of talent around. The three committees that would interest me would be education, uh, clean environment, solar energy and parks and criminal reform. We've got a lot to do to, to balance uh, law and order and make sure that the police uh, the races are gone. Uh, when it comes to education, you heard what I had to say, but when it comes to uh, the environment, uh, we are a city of so-called progressives. It's time to talk the talk. Um, we have done so little to clean up our environment, to encourage solar energy, uh, tidal energy, build these products in New York. And I think it's time for us to really be in the forefront and be a model for the country to be proud of. We've done too little. We have too few trees in here. We have parks that are in disrepair. So these are the sort of things I'd also like to focus on. Carmen. Thank you. It's really hard to pick which committees um, because the, it's kind of like the issues in our communities are so intersectional. We want to have a voice in all of them, but definitely the finance committee, because I believe in budget equity and that budget equity needs to be introduced into the negotiation process. Housing, because of the displacement issue that I mentioned before, and small businesses, because they're the lifeblood of our community. I'm a daughter of a bodeguero. He owned a grocery store. My dad owned the grocery store in the Bronx when no one wanted to open up a business in the Bronx. And I know what it was like to have that business shutter. So those are the three committees I'd pick. 
Thank you. Steve, what do you have next? I'm not sure if it's a, in your district. I did something in your neighboring district yesterday. There, there are some HDFCs, which are, uh, they were, they originally, I've gotten some, I've done a series of stories about the third party transfer in HDFCs. And a lot of HDFC uh, owners, co-op owners feel they were sold a, a bad bill of goods and nonprofit developers came in and originally gave them apartments, co-ops for really cheap. And they really weren't able to build equity in those apartments. And now these same nonprofit developers that were created when these buildings were a dollar are coming back in and say, you know what, you got to move out and we're gonna we're gonna rebuild them and make them more affordable. And they're getting zero percent loans from uh, HPD. And I, you know, I've heard from the actual tenants that feel that it, it was a, uh, you know. So I'm wondering, would you address some of these HFD, HDFC owners and the third party transfer program? And does that affect your district? I'm sorry if it. Uh, I'm not sure. James, let's start with you. Look, I'm all in favor of, of allowing for ownership and, and co-ops and things like that, but uh, I'm gonna have to pivot that I'm very much concerned about what's happening with NYCHA. And, and the rents are out of control, uh, not just for tenants, but for businesses. Now, um, I think that we need to focus more on the big picture. And, and as my colleagues have intelligently pointed out, there's too many people in the city who cannot make their rent. And we need to restore things, maybe Mitchell Lama. I, I think that it's time for us to, to really rebuild NYCHA. Politicians have been talking about this for years. And now that we have a friendly White House for a change, God bless, uh, we need to get some money pumped into NYCHA. I, th I think it's an outrage that, that uh, people are going without hot water and mold is going in those buildings. Uh, there are plenty of non nitro buildings where the same thing is happening. And that's what I think has to be more our focus. Uh, we have too much red tape in the city. We have too many bureaucrats. We have too many problems. We can't go with the establishment. I'm the non-establishment guy who wants to think out of the box. Uh, more of the same thing, more of the same solutions that have been tried for the last uh, generation or two. We're going to have the same disgrace 20, 30 years from now. Uh, but I want to start with NYCHA. I think it's it's incredible that people are living like that and how politicians and incumbents and establishment have allowed this to go on. It's got to end. Joanna. Um, answering the question about TIL and HDOC, um, if you were doing, uh, if you were hosting District 7, then I know that's a huge issue um, in that neighboring district. Um, I've actually worked with some of the coalitions around that. Um, and at the bottom, at the end of the day, yes, we do have those issues, um, not as much as uh, in District 7, but we do have till buildings. We do have a few HDFCs uh, in District 10. Um, and they were they were sold a, a bad a, a, a bad bag of goods. You know, they were towed something and then they were swindled um, in terms of maintenance and the, regu the regulations behind it really do not allow uh, for empowering uh, the tenants uh, to take control. And also it interferes with uh, gaining generational wealth. Um, and that's especially true with Till. Um, one of the huge, um, I would say, villains um, in this process is the way the HPD has handled it. Um, it is complicated. There's different legislation that's really looking at uh, combing through that. Um, we do have situations where we have to provide, and the city should be uh, responsible for this, uh, but provide tenants the, the technical resources as well as the funding and the, the reforms to policies and regulations to make it work. Uh, right now, uh, the city coming back and saying, you know what, we're going to take this over or it's derelict or uh, it just provides so much insecurity to what generations of families have invested in when it comes to Till and HDFC. Angela. I would agree with what um, uh, Johanna said. I mean, the third party transfers we know has been um, uh, happening quite a bit in the in Brooklyn. And, uh, and also in, in District 7. Uh, but what, you know, the, the orientation, the approach, I think, of any city council member and mayor has to be, what tools do we need to strengthen to ensure that people who are in their homes, like folks 
who have apartments in HDFC apartments can actually not only stay, but thrive. Um, so I would be um, a, a number one advocate in ensuring that um, uh, we do not implement or enforce uh, laws or policies that actually um, uh, can have people continuing to live um, in, uh, in housing stock that is not of the best quality or at risk of losing their homes, especially when they themselves are also the owners or even if they're not the owners, but just, um, uh, but you understand what I mean on that. Carmen. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, there absolutely is a need to address TIL and HDFCs and what's happened to these tenants in District 10. I've worked personally with a few TIL buildings uh, that were in the process of becoming HDFCs and were not able to get there because of the third party transfer. And I think the colleagues uh, described it correctly when they said that they sold these tenants a false dream. I believe that is, it is also an issue of racial justice because this would not be happening in a community that was not an immigrant minority communities of color. Uh, where people are being told, here you go, you get to own your own building. They, they, they made sure that the buildings were completely neglected from technical support, from making sure that uh, they had financial support to upkeep these buildings. They gave them no, absolutely no help. And now they're saying, well, you did a bad job. So we're taking them over again. It's the, the perfect example of putting profits over people and displacing our community. So the city has to do right by these tenants. They have to honor their ability to keep ownership of these buildings. And frankly, I believe that the entire system has to be uh, analyzed, audited, and we have to make sure that these tenants are supported so that they can own their apartments in the future. And that is my puppy, um, Teddy. Uh, he is being loud because he hears people at the door. Well, I'm concerned your puppy's a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> He's outraged by what's happening to the two. And <laughs> Good, smart puppy. <laughs> All right. So, Go I'm for sorry. it, Stephen. You know, if is the 175th stop, is that your district, 175th Street? So if yeah. I got off at 175th and I was a stranger to the district, which I am a lot, where would you tell me to go? Where would you say, hey, you got to check this out in the district? Well, I would say, I would say, um, uh, you know, 175th in Fort Washington, if it's the A train, I would say go to the United Palace and, um, uh, and actually try and get inside. Um, unfortunately, I don't think they have it open to the public, which I think is something that I would want to change as well, uh, because the lobby and the theater is absolutely stunning. It's a gem in uh, in in our in our community, and it's closed. It's right? an architectural gem, and okay. then right next to it, a plaza with a farmers market that um, throughout the summer on Sunday, um, all afternoon and evening, um, you have great music. It's actually a tremendous space for senior citizens. A lot of seniors are out there dancing in the plaza all Sunday afternoon. So make sure you come on a Sunday starting, it's just started this last Sunday and will continue through until October. You d definitely should come up on a Sunday afternoon, 175th Street, and then walk over to the plaza right, right next to the United Palace and do some dancing. Thank you. I, I, would, I would say, um, come, come with an empty stomach and mm. stop by El Malecon, which oh, has yeah. famous Dominican cuisine. And then you can take a walk to the High Bridge Park and walk the High Bridge, it's beautiful kind of hidden treasure that links upper Manhattan and the Bronx. Um, and you'll be able to walk the calories off there. <laughs> yeah. I would invite you. Um, so that's two blocks away for our, from where I was born and raised. So I would tell you to text me so I can meet you. Um, mm -hmm. I'll show you where I went to school, elementary school, and make sure you go to Jay Hood, J. Hood um, right Park, where you can have a beautiful view of the George Washington Bridge um, and the water. And then I'll ask you to walk up a block to my mother's house so you can have some arroz con pollo with frijoles. <laughs> yeah, I, like I, I, I agree with the assemblywoman, by the way. Um, I like that restaurant very much. Ask for the pollo con horno, okay? chicken uh, or um, savoya, the onions. Uh, the, the restaurants there, it's so wonderful. And the pastry shops, um, walk west and go down to the river. And you see why we like to live here. Let's go to the White House, uh, the lighthouse, and then walk south 
all the way to 145th Street and Riverside Park. Uh, it's just the most wonderful uh, stroll in the city. Uh, if I might deviate, go north. Uh, we, we still have uh, primal forests uh, as they were 500 years ago. It's uh, one of the most hidden treasures in the very northernmost part of the city. Uh, so anyway, sorry for going too far north for you guys. No, it's okay. What neighborhood is that? Where where the where it's really woodsy? Inwood, Inwood, Indian in Road. Uh, um, yeah, you'll see the big C uh, uh, for Columbia, Dykeman Stadium, that whole area. It's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I love Twin Donuts too, by the way. <laughs> I've actually heard a lot about the Dominican restaurants in your district. Oh yeah, you, you can't go wrong. They're all great. They, you know, do that one day. I like that. You may have to go on a diet afterwards, though. <laughs> the pastry shots, especially. Oh, they're incredible. Oh. Um, James, to speak to what you're saying, I actually, um, back, I used to live in Riverdale for a, for a point. I would play tennis at um, Inwood Hill Park. And yeah. uh, it was beautiful. I love the drive down. Coming over the bridge, you see the, the sea on Columbia. Something really, really cool. As you can tell, uh, we're starting to get into the more light and fun end of our debate, which is why I'm about to ask you next, whenever the city does legitimately fully reopen, what is a notorious tourist activity that you are going to shamelessly do? <laughs> Me? Okay. Well, first of all, we need to bring the tourists back and uh, we, could, we should take a page out of the 1970s. Uh, I love New York. Remember that campaign? Uh, look, I, I, among the other things, I'm also a composer. I miss going to Carnegie Hall. I miss going to Lincoln Center. I miss the plays. Um, I don't miss taking the subway downtown, but uh, th those are the sort of things that make New York wonderful and special. And we've got to take care of the artistic community. I mean, it's a tragedy. I'm a Juilliard graduate as well. I, I joke, I have two JDs, a Juilliard degree and a Juris doctor. Can you imagine the tragedy of being a ballerina of being uh, in the orchestra and they lost a year of their life. And I wanna go back to the ballet. You know, that is just, this, everything was beautiful in the ballet. Remember that from chorus line? Yeah, this is what makes New York special. We're gonna bring it back. We need to have our government work hard with the Broadway uh, producers in the industry to right. bring back all the tourists because uh, that's what makes our city wonderful. It's a tragic loss, but we'll get it back. And our city government needs to push really hard about these things and cooperate with the artistic community, get government support and funding for the theaters that have been shut down for a year and work with the Broadway uh, producers and theaters to get their ideas and innovative ideas. Like maybe we need to have very clean airplanes and work with the airline industries to encourage people to fly back. There's just so much we can do. There's not enough time. I right, thank you. looking for your favorite place here. I mean, uh, where, where you would go. Where, hello, I'm from. Who, who else wants to jump in? I would, uh, so I went to LaGuardia for art, so I have a real hankering for the art and I, and I agree it, it has taken one of the biggest hits um, in tourism. Uh, so I would have torture my kids and go to every art museum there is. I love, uh, I can spend uh, days um, in art museums, um, but they'll probably uh, push me towards seeing at least one movie um because what's a movie what's a movie i forgot it's been so what long what is a movie <laughs> remember, the the movie? remember in movie theaters <laughs> um i i guess that you know i'm one of those people that never leaves uptown unless i'm going to albany um and so for me one of my favorite things to do is to walk the district i i live in inwood so i walk all the way down and um, my daughter loves the parks so we visit the, the different playgrounds, the playgrounds in Inwood Hill. We go over to Fort Triumph. There's a beautiful uh, renovated Jacob Javits playground. I'm just looking forward to doing those things, um, eating some ice cream along the way and talk to folks. Like I just miss uh, that the camaraderie and the, and the uh, peace that walking gives. Um, so, but if I had to do a really touristy thing, I'd probably go back down to Times Square. I haven't been there in a while. You wouldn't like what you see. Um, so, uh, I know it sounds, I'm going to bring up dancing again. Um, but, uh, but, um, the, 
Lincoln Center has, uh, you know, kind of just a Latin uh, dancing uh, from all different countries in South America um, uh, on uh, certain Saturdays in the summer. And it's a lot of fun. So when that get, gets back up and running, I'm going to definitely uh, want to do that. But there's, you know, also live music in, uh, in our district as well um, that, uh, that I just, I got a peek of one um, in, uh, in someone's uh, apartment. Um, uh, they uh, opened up their apartment. People were standing in the hallway. They had live jazz um, uh, coming out of their apartment. And when it was, a, it's a famous apartment that does this and they just resumed it uh, this, uh, this weekend. And, uh, I happened, um, to stumble upon it. So it was, uh, it was great. So I look forward to seeing uh, more of that in our district and enjoying that. So what is something that you want people to know about your district that they might not know just by thinking of upper Manhattan? And this is in no particular order, by the way. So anybody, yeah, I would like to, it. I would like to say that in Northern Manhattan, it's got, it's a vibe. And it's a vibe that unfortunately I feel that downtown, the further downtown has kind of lost that. It's a vibe that is like, when you walk around, you feel like, oh yeah, this is the New York, um, you know, that, that I've always known as a kid. And, uh, and, it's, a, and it's a great thing. Hmm. I yeah. think following up on that, on that comment that Angela made, um, you know, our community is one, where you walk down St. Nicholas Avenue, you see street vendors, you get the smell of the Dominican food, you walk down Broadway, uh, you see small cafes popping up. It's, it, it really is a community that's full of joy, um, full of laughter and, and full of love. And so that is something that I, that I like people to know. Besides like obviously the enormous amount of green space and parks that we have uptown that are truly are a treasure, um, just the, the laughter and joy that you hear on, on, a, on the streets um, as you walk through them really is something that's fulfilling for me. I think we all ought to open up a tourist bureau. <laughs> I'm really enjoying it, you know, because yeah. it is somebody that one of the better parts I'm just going to chime in that I like about being on these debates is I'm learning about all these communities. And it's just it's really cool. You know, it's what makes a city the city. Excuse me. I'm, not, I'm going to really criticize uh, the uh, my colleagues. No one talked about the cloisters. Hey, I didn't what's wrong? <laughs> well, of course. I mean, I mean that, that was a church that was taken apart and imported. Uh, and people come from all over the world uh, to see that, and uh, that's right. It's right in our community. We have the most beautiful views of the Hudson in, in that estate that was graciously given to the city by the Rockefellers in the 1930s. That's that's probably the first place to go. So there is a lot of history. I mean, it's also the place of the um, not to not to put a, like a low note, but the assassination of a Malcolm X. There's just so much history. And there actually used to be um, like a tourist kind of um, like a little car. I forget what it, what the right name is for it, but it was on 166th Street and St. Nicholas. Um, and so we had groups that were really committed to like educating people on the arts and the hidden gems. We have the Morris Jamal Mansion. Um, I mean, we have some incredible sites uh, in North of Manhattan. So raise your hand if you would vote for a Republican. <laughs> okay. Okay. Raise your hand <laughs> if you would vote for a DSA candidate. Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you think Scott Stringer should drop out of the race. <sighs> kind of, you know. It's that. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. Say something nice about one of your fellow candidates. Uh, they're, they're very accomplished, uh, and I respect their accomplishments. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. It's just a question of who, who has the best vision uh, for the future. Being accomplished uh, and being part of the establishment is not enough. You have to lead. And sometimes leading means we need to go in a different direction. But yeah, they're all, all very smart. And like I said, I'm, I'm really honored to be here uh, with these three people. Well, I'm going to make a comment that's not tinged in establishment remarks. I feel that the women on this panel are highly intelligent and accomplished and that the district would be in great hands if any of them were the councilwoman. 
-hmm. And I want to um, uh, um, share specifically um, uh, because um, I do, um, uh, you know, know the work of um, of the Assemblywoman and of Joanna. I think Joanna has done um, a great job of elevating the issue of this high stakes testing. It is such an important issue, and I think also. Um, teaching parents that they can say no to the testing. So I just want to thank her for that. And for Carmen, um, uh, you know, your work um, in the assembly, um, uh, especially um, around getting this funded excluded workers, as you know, I mean, it's something that is very um, near and dear to me um, uh, with because of the work that I've done around immigration. But I do know how pretty much you know, impossible that would have even been, you know, a year ago. And, uh, and so thank you for your hard work and getting that done. It's going to transform um, many, many lives. I think patting on the shoulders is inappropriate. There was reported this week that 16,000 people have left the community and they have a different opinion about how things are going. That's a lot of people we lost. Um, Angela, I don't know if you were done. I, I don't want to step on your words. Thank no. you. Um, uh, and no, I just didn't want to, I wanted to acknowledge, um, you know, um, uh, James, I only met you, I think, for the first time now this morning um, in our debate. So um, uh, I, you know, I, I want to thank you for your participation and for running. I just don't, I don't, it's nothing personal. I just don't know any, uh, you know, about your accomplishments, except for what you shared, which um, sound very impressive. Yeah, and I, I want to say that I've worked with um, with Angela and Carmen over the years in different capacities, um, and I know firsthand their uh, commitment to this uh, community. And um, uh, I think that um, collectively um, we've done a lot of great things together. Very good. Um, I'm gonna unless you have something, Alex. Well, uh, uh, two things. One, I'd like everyone to um, before we wrap up. You know, I'd like to give everyone an opportunity to, to say something more about their campaign. But before that, I have one more uh, raise your hand question and raise your hand if you think that the Houston Astros should be booed every time they reenter Yankee Stadium for the rest of time. OK, we have two hands up from one candidate. Can I raise my foot? <laughs> I, you know, if I was going to, I, I know it's in the Bronx, but it's, it's still New York, guys. I, what what do you say? I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Oh, here I think about the specialized high school thing. What do you say to the argument from Asians who are who are not people of, of you know, they're You're not talking about baseball. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. But I, I hear it. But they'd say, hey, we're below the poverty rate. We work hard. We put our kids. We force them to test. And you either know the math and science or you don't. And it's not, it's not a question of color, you know, to get into Bronx School of Science, you know the math or you know the science or you don't. And that we're impoverished, we're working two jobs, our kids are being punished. How do you respond to that? What would you tell the Asian community? I can start. I, I would say, first of all, uh, the Asian community that um, is has that narrative does not speak for the whole Asian community. Um, I know a lot of Asian communities that are actually on the side of, of um, reforming and actually eliminating the Shasat. Um, I will also say that um, why do you have to work two jobs for your child to get a good education? Why do you have to work so hard uh, to meet a standard um, that actually was based on 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 the racist uh, uh, racist uh, policies. Um, if you want your child to be successful, why not work for all children to be successful? Because when your child's successful and your child's peer is successful, we all actually benefit um, from an education system that serves every single child um, in the system. I want to agree with that. Um, I want to say that uh, Joanna hit the nail on the head when she said that this was based on a racist system. Um, actually, the, the test was introduced because they were trying to keep people out of these schools. And so this is not about the Asian community versus the Black community versus the Latino community. This is about um, us being able to prepare our children to succeed wherever they may be and giving them the opportunity and the access to do so in all of our schools. Um, so that's the only thing I would add to Joanna's answer. Well, I, I think that um, watering down the education system is not the answer. If people work hard, they study hard. I, I don't want to see uh, Stuyvesant uh, brought down. 
Uh, I think the answer is that we need to create double as many quality schools uh, and keep quality and understand that the harder you work in life, the better you do. So I, I think that there are a lot of uh, schools that produce hardworking kids who don't um, uh, provide for opportunities uh, for better schools. We need to double the special schools, triple. We need to change the whole way we change these. I, I've seen so many families stressing out. It's like they're applying for Harvard and, and they're in eighth grade. The stress has got to end. People have got to stop feeling that they've got to move out of the city to get a good education. Well, the, the stress is because of testing, and I think I'm um, saying that it's yeah. watered down education. It's a little bit of a, a of a extending the racist narrative. Um, we're not talking about dumbing down education. Um, everyone works hard, and to imply that someone that doesn't get um, into a specialized high school didn't work as hard um, is actually the racist uh, racist system that we're trying to dismantle. The schools in the Bronx that don't ever have a, a student end up in the in the specialized high schools, we're ignoring that they're under-resourced, they're overcrowded, they don't have the right services, they don't have a counselor, or maybe if they do, it's more than 800 to one. And then we're not comparing it to the kind of public educations that are in wealthier zip codes where there are smaller, smaller classrooms and there are more resources. We're also, not, we're also not taking into account that we have parents that have deep pockets that can access the kind of tutoring that passes the Shasat. One thing, that, one thing that's a fact about the specialized high school exam you cannot pass that test without getting supplemental tutoring outside of what you're learning in the classroom. It is not a reflection of what you're learning in the classroom. Well, I don't think it's disingenuous to, to even imply uh, racism. There's, don't tell me about racism when half of my family was murdered. I, I simply uh, am saying that uh, we need to change the whole system and give everyone equal access. Uh, I think that there is something unfair that the, people with more money can afford those books and afford those training programs. I completely disagree with that. I'm simply saying that I want Stuyvesant to remain a top quality school and I want to double the effort and the number of schools that kids go to. There's nothing about racism. It's about making sure that the schools that are not performing are doing their job. I agree with that. Yeah. Angela? No, um, uh, I... Um believe that, um, number one, that the Asian community is incredibly diverse. Um, so I think to even kind of propose that question, um, that's, you know, that is actually not taking into account um, uh, the entire community and how they feel and how they see um, what needs to be done to come to get into a good school. But um, uh, definitely, I agree with Joanna and I agree with what Carmen has said, you know, there is absolutely no reason um, uh, why we should put this kind of level of stress on families and on children who some of them commit suicide as a result to get into a uh, Dike, quote, you know, you know, good school. Yes, of course. Yes, Stuyvesant's a great school for certain um, uh, measurements. Um, Brock Science is a great school for certain measurements, but there are excellent math and science schools in New York City that do not require having to go through this level of stress um, uh, to get in. And we have to create a system. I mean, let's look at Scarsdale. Scarsdale's per pupil funding is, well, when I looked at it maybe 10 years ago was $40,000. I'm sure it's much higher now, $50,000. Whereas the per pupil funding for New York City schools, when I looked at it back then was about $12,000 per year. So, you know, if we really want to talk about this, you know, let's talk about the embedded racism and classism in our governmental system and in our public school system. We have to have a very straight conversation about that. And until we do, we're going to keep falling into the same traps around these conversations. Hmm. Yet, when you mentioned Scarsdale, I'm just going to con conversate. Yeah. When you talk about Scarsdale, there's charter schools in Harlem and some of the poorest neighborhoods of New York City where their testing is better than the kids in Scarsdale. So uh, I, do you oppose charter schools? I think that the charter school movement has um, uh, done a disservice, I, I, but I do support um, uh, communities that want to use the charter um, school uh, tool as a way to open a community school. Um, uh, but no, I actually there, we have to look at Success Academy. Success Academy has serious problems. We can't just look at scores 
test scores as the only way to measure whether a school is actually performing and serving its students. Success Academy may have great scores, but they're rife with pushing special ed kids out of their schools, rife with pushing ESL kids out of their school, and horrible disciplinary problems where they send, take their children over to the police department if the parent doesn't come and pick them up because they say that's the rules. But that to me is an abdication of your responsibility as a school to just take a child and drop them off at a police department. So yeah. no, you know, we, this is, you know, I'm sorry. Okay. No, All right. if, I, if I might make a comment with your permission, um, the, the most horrible form of racism is when kids are not given a proper education and education is about character, it's about teachers doing their job. It's not about fudging grades and letting kids fail and go on. I've talked to too many teachers That's where half the kids about. don't, let, please, let me finish. You've had your chance. When, when I hear from school teachers that half of the kids often don't show up and they have to do the same topic uh, and, then they're, and then they're maybe under pressure to give better grades, we're not in disagreement, but I simply think we need to toughen the standards, all the schools and provide more tutors and, and, and in uh, libraries and everywhere and work with parents and deal with mental health problems. Uh, I am very uh, outraged by the unfair things that are happening in the city and we need to change it. Anyone else on that? Yes, uh, so the model of charter schools is predicated on a business model where uh, test scores equals uh, a good school. And so the way that charter schools recruit um, from public schools is saying, if you come to this school, we promise that we will give you test scores. We will give you high test scores. So you'll, you'll, you'll be able to produce it. As Angela mentioned, um, you know, there's a recruitment process that is called very targeted marketing. Uh, my children uh, were actually, uh, <laughs> actually experienced it. Out of the three children, I had one child who tested for gifted and talented, two children with IEPs, which means uh, special needs in the school system. And it was only the child that had tested for gifted and talented that was consistently marketed. I would get mailers in the mailbox. Hey, do you wanna go to this charter school? Hey, how about this charter school? So there is a business model where they, they, they cream and then if you're not cutting it, especially around third grade, they counsel you out and say, this probably isn't the best school for you. The other thing about charter school is that they usurp public funding from the neighborhood school. The money, the money that is attached to that student in public school, if that student goes to the charter school, it leaves it leaves the, the public school system and it goes um, and stays with charter schools. So when you mentioned Steve, um, Harlem, Harlem almost has like a rivaling uh, school system. There's the public school system and it's, it's at the verge of being um, overtaken by, by charter schools because charters have access to marketing. Charter schools have to like glossy, you know, canvassers with, with leaflets. Uh, they can have subway ads and public schools don't have that. Public schools again have been underserved, overcrowded and under-resourced. And just to add one thing to all of these comments that my colleagues have made, and that is that the co-location of charter schools within public school buildings, um, I have seen firsthand how it creates a atmosphere in our schools of the have versus the have nots. Why? Because we know that many of the, of the charter schools that unfortunately are in our community are funded by rich billionaires, millionaires that are pumping money into these charter schools with no really oversight of what happens. And so when two schools are pitted against each other for services, for extracurricular activity, it just hones in the point to our children that some children have more and other, children's ha and other children have less, rather than the idea that they should all be learning, that they should all be thriving in these environments, in these buildings that are designed for their future. Um, and so that is some of the issues that I think we've seen in our community. If, if I might add, throwing more money at the problem is not gonna solve it. If kids are going home to broken families, if there's drugs in the streets, uh, the father is, is, is in drug, they're living homeless. I mean, there are psychological and major problems that are not being addressed. And I think we need to rebuild the way we teach education, like just like the police force. We need to focus more on psychological problems. We need to get more people walking into people's homes, helping the parents. Maybe they are having trouble with English. Help them with the English. Help them teach the children. We need to have far more individual attention 
to all the problems that are going on in the homes. And I think that we have ignored these realities for generations. Forget charter school. How about making sure that there's education in the home? We all grew up. You're all very accomplished people. We had parents who helped us out. Uh, if a mother is working 14 hours a day, she can't help the kid. And what's he going to do all afternoon? And look at the influences sometimes in the neighborhoods. I think we need to really reopen how we view education and put some more money in areas where it's really going to make a difference. I agree with James. Um, that's why it's so important. Um, and there's been a big push for something that's called um, community school. Community schools are uh, like school communities where you have everything. You have you have a school health based health clinic. You have social workers, you just have wraparound services, not just supporting the, uh, the student in the classroom, but the dynamics of the family. Um, and I actually walked 150 miles uh, to Albany to make sure that we got the funding that was owed to our schools. Um, and it is our hope. And yes, accountability for those dollars that we got. We got uh, more than $4 billion for our schools. We got money from the federal government. And we have to make sure um, that there's accountability to using that money to support our families. You, the, the mayor proposed a $98.6 billion budget. Do you think it was bloated at all? It's kind of, a, it's bigger than the entire state of Florida. Do you think that there could be some fat trim from that? God, of course there can be. There's just so much bureaucracy um, and there's so many changes that have to be made. I mean, I think that uh, if, I, if I'm elected to city council, oh. <laughs> uh, we're going to have to have some blue ribbon commissions and see how much money's being wasted. Uh, we need more teachers and less uh, people in, in administration. Hmm. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Well, I would say that I think part of the reason for that bloating or what perceived bloating is that there was a, an infusion of federal dollars that came into the state for COVID relief and, and the state passed that money directly to, like Joanna mentioned in the previous comment, to, for example, the Department of Education. The state didn't touch that money. The state passed it right through. And the and, state um, had $212 billion budget. You're in the assembly? Yes. That was a record budget. Yes. It was a record budget, but we are we are confronting a record, uh, a historic crisis with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, a billion dollars was put towards small businesses. Uh, Angela mentioned earlier, we passed the first in the nation fund for excluded workers. We made sure that there was money being put into our, our healthcare system, our, our, our health and hospitals, our, our nursing homes, right? So there's so much in this crisis that involves not only um, the economics of the state and the city, but also um, investing into communities that for decades have not been invested into. So it, 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 it seems that way, but given the financial crisis that we're in, um, that money is needed in order to, to advance recovery. Uh, Steve, I really wish that you asked th this series of questions like 20 Sorry. minutes sooner. Unfortunately, we do have to, to wrap. We could have saved the Houston Astros question for later. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was very. I really enjoyed the conversation. You're all, you know, you, I, my, you know, my hat off to all of you. You know, you're involved. You're, you know, mothers and fathers and good, you know, and I'm gonna be up there to eat one day. So maybe even this. <laughs> Absolutely, week. Steve. I'll join you for that. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining our Schneps Media Rapid Fire Debates. Uh, Steve and I are going to be back in what appears to be 23 minutes with uh, the Bronx's <laughs> District 11. I know. Uh, again, thank you all so much. Uh, really appreciated the spirit towards the end. And best of luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.